Uh, I am particularly pleased to, um, to have him with us today uh, to talk about a book that he's done. I'm going to look at the title here. It says, The Politics and Economics of Britain's Foreign Aid, The Pergau Dam Affair. He's seen the policymaking from the inside, which as another former insider I think is very valuable. Uh, and uh, having spent a career in part uh, in what is now the Department of International Relations, uh, International Development, Development, DFID, <laughs> in Britain, although it wasn't, I think, that then when you were there, mm -hmm. and uh, and then has been at Ox at Oxford and at and, and at SOAS, so he's had a kind of one of these scholarly and practitioner careers that we all like and admire. Um, I came first in contact with the issue that Tim is writing about, has written about when I was doing my own research on British aid, and I came across this wonderful story, and I think I have it right, that ActionAid took the British government. Was it not ActionAid? That World took Development the Movement. The World Development Movement. Movement. Yeah, that okay. took the uh, legal action. But anyway, taking the British government to court because they spent uh, a portion of their foreign aid mm. on a blatantly commercial uh, activity with a lot of other uh, challenges with it, uh, I, I was thinking, Woo, wouldn't that be interesting if it happened here? Uh, in <laughs> fact, the environmentalists have taken the administration to court uh, in the distant past with, I suspect, a different outcome. But anyway, bef let me not say any more about this interesting and important book, and let me turn it over to Tim. Thank you so much for being here, Tim. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, I'm talking about a, a book I've, uh, I've written um, on the Pergau Dam affair. Um, I was a, a central player in this episode, this most controversial episode in the uh, British history of British aid, the funding of this hydroelectric project. Um, and I thought it was time for a critical account of exactly what happened and why. I had my own memories because I was heavily involved in this episode. Um, and there were quite a few official documents in the public domain because there were several uh, inquiries which I will tell you about later. But I needed to fill in quite a few gaps and uh, in 2010, I was given access to most of the uh, government files with the uh, <coughs> exception, as you can imagine, of the, our Ministry of Defense, who wanted to uh, maintain a veil over their sorry uh, contribution to this saga. Um, the Pergau Dam and Hydro Project lies high up in forested mountains on the Malay-Thai border. The dam and the reservoir aren't large by the standards of the Indus dams or indeed the Bakun dam in eastern Malaysia. Uh, the the, the uh, reservoir is fed from, a, from a, a meandering river, not a big river, called the Pergau, hence the, the name, but also from a smaller adjoining catchment, catchments. A mile below the dam is an underground cavern which houses uh, um, four massive 150 megawatt uh, turbines, and for three hours a day, water comes crashing down a concrete tunnel from the reservoir and drives these turbines, which in turn drive generators, which uh, helps to meet uh, peaking electricity demand in Kuala Lumpur, several hundred miles to the south. I visited the, the project in 2010. It works well. It all looks very impressive. There's a fantastic maintenance culture. The people who work there are very proud of it. Um, the trouble is, the funding of this project was from our aid budget in the early 90s was far from normal. In a nutshell, the project was wildly uneconomic and the funding was linked to a major arms deal. My book is a story of commercial interests in Britain supported by a dominating Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, who had no interest in aid as an instrument of development, uh, trumping sound economics and uh, sound development. But it's also a story of an even more dominant prime minister in Malaysia, Mohamed Mahathir, uh, who insisted on aid to lubricate a major arms deal. And he wanted a hydro scheme for his country's national power system that the power company didn't want and didn't need for another 10 to 15 years. It's a, it's a governance story as much as an aid story. Uh, it's a story of conflicting policy agendas in Whitehall, that's shorthand for British government, um, and the inability of a professionally strong but politically weak 
uh, government department, the aid ministry, to stand up for itself. And it's a story, as so happens in government, and don't forget this, of mishap and muddle. When the facts began to emerge in 1993, two and a half years after the aid had been approved, they caused a political and media storm um, unlike anything else in the history of British aid. The reputation of a distinguished foreign minister, foreign secretary, Douglas Hurd, was uh, severely tarnished, albeit, as I shall explain later, uh, to some extent unjustifiably so. The standing of Britain's aid program was severely damaged. There was a rupture in trade relations between Malaysia and Britain, and to cap it all, as Carol has pointed out, the decision to provide the aid was declared unlawful in the courts. Before I describe what happened, it's worth my, my saying a word about the British aid program as it was in the late 1980s when all this started to happen. The 1980s decade was not a good one for British aid. Between 1979 and 89, the aid budget was roughly halved in real terms. And because of rising contributions to the World Bank and the U European Union, the bilateral budget, that's to say the amount of money which Britain spent directly um, in uh, developing countries, it was cut by more than half over that decade. The aid ministry was known as the Overseas Development Administration, ODA for short at that time. It retained its reputation for professionalism, which it, it had had from the earliest days in the 1960s, um, yet there were growing doubts about the effectiveness of British aid uh, because of the dire economic performance of many of the recipients in Africa and uh, in South Asia. And added to this, the British aid program uh, became much more overtly commercial and less development focused. Now from the start, British aid, like many others, um, aid programs had been tied to the purchase of goods and services from Britain, just like the American program was at that time. But then in 1977, in an attempt to cozy up to assuage the labor unions and big business, James Callaghan's labor government went one step further by introducing something called the Aid and Trade Provision, ATP for short. Now under the ATP, aid projects originated not from discussions between governments and uh, ODA, as was the normal case, but from British companies um, operating overseas. Such projects were then assessed by our Department of Trade and Industry, DTI, for their so-called industrial and commercial benefits. And if approved, as they usually were by the DTI, they were passed on to ODA for appraisal against the traditional criteria of development soundness and economic viability. Now, in practice, the projects that came forward under this ATP were, were not very good. The appraisals were very light touch. And as... Uh, as the 1980s progressed, the ATP budget was, uh, grew and uh, it rose to about 10% of the total bilateral spend. More and more projects came to be approved that were at best marginal in development terms. Even before per Gao, the ex post evaluations of ATP projects indicated very poor results in development terms. And despite claims that exporters needed uh, the scheme to compete with uh, um, other countries, the actual benefits for the British economy were highly questionable. This was a protection scheme, basically. Pergau was the last, the largest, not the last, the largest and the worst of the dozens of ATP projects that secured funding um, before the ATP scheme was finally abolished by Tony Blair's government in 1997. ATP was a bad scheme because it encouraged British contractors to come up with projects which required subsidy and because there was no competition when contracts came to be let. Uh, the contractors saw ATP as a honeypot, basically, and they usually had the uncritical support of the DTI. For ODA, the handling of these projects felt like continuous guerrilla warfare uh, with the other department, the DTI, and the ODA was usually on the losing side. And ODA was certainly the, the big loser when it came to the Pergau project. Now, the disastrous decision-making on Pergau, at least for the aid department for ODA was partly a function of the relative power of the various ministries in Britain and of their long-standing cultures and interests. It was also a function of the personal views and biases of certain key individuals in, in government. No amount of analytical capability, of which uh, 
the British government had plenty, could compensate for these two factors. I think this is worth remembering in a wider context. Uh, as bureaucrats and technocrats, we tend to, we like to think that uh, arguments are played out according to uh, uh, the rationale, the rationality, but often they're not. Um, Pergau um, was hardly a, a unique feature of British government, or indeed any, any government, but it's worth remembering that uh, alongside the analytical the analysis, that there are usually personal and departmental um, biases that come into play, and this was certainly the case with the Pergau decision-making. Chapter four of my book goes into this in some detail, but today I'm just going to talk briefly about the key decision-maker on Pergau, namely Margaret Thatcher. I worked for her, I was on her personal staff for three years, two and a half years, uh, from 1979 to 1981. Um, and I, uh, I had considerable admiration for many of the things she did on the domestic uh, front because the British economy was suffering from a severe um, disease in the 1970s and it needed some pretty courageous action to, to, to get us out of that. And she, she, uh, I think she achieved that and got the British economy onto a much better plane. Um, but on the aid front, frankly, um, she was very disappointing. She had no interest or belief in development assistance on two occasions when I worked in her office, I tried to persuade her to see Robert McNamara, and I think she, was, she must have been the only head of government anywhere who refused to, uh, a request from Robert McNamara to meet her. Um, remember, he was the uh, president of the World Bank and the, pre the preeminent figure in the development world, in the development aid world at that time. She couldn't see any point in meeting him. She was influenced by the neoliberal view, um, epitomized in the work of Peter Bauer, Professor Peter Bauer at London School of Economics, that aid actually made things worse rather than better in developing countries. She also believed that charity um, was for individuals, not governments. Um, and uh, the idea that rich governments had a moral duty to help the poor was outside her repertoire. So not surprisingly, the one bit of the aid program she was interested in uh, was the aid and trade provision, the ATP, which I mentioned earlier which was all about um, commercial, uh, commercial funding. So what, in effect, we had uh, in Britain at that time was an, an official policy based on legislation and numerous policy statements that aid was and had to be principally for development. And we also had a, an informal policy driven at the highest level of government that aid could and should be used principally to advance Britain's commercial and political interests. In earlier years, it had been thought that with imagination and restraint, and I believe this too, the two objectives could be uh, uh, pursued in parallel. But with Pergao, the development interest was effectively jettisoned, and that is the source of all the trouble that followed. The Pergao story starts in March 1988, when the British Defence Minister, a man called George Younger, visits Malaysia to, to promote arms exports. He signs a secret protocol which promises 200 million pounds in aid for civil projects. That's about $500 million in today's terms. Uh, he promises 200 million pounds for civil projects uh, in return for Malaysia purchasing 1 billion pounds worth of defense equipment. Now the promise of, uh, of aid in return for arms sales was totally against long established British policy. It was against the rules of the OECD, to which Britain was a signatory, and it implied a substantial raid on the British aid budget. Uh, George Younger had specifically been warned by the Treasury, I was in the Treasury at the time, before he left London, that he was not on any t in any case to offer any financial sweeteners. He later ex explained that without the aid offer, the deal on weapons sh wouldn't have happened, and, th and that he hadn't had time to consult London. It's more likely that his official advisors from the Ministry of Defense, um, in particular an organization called the Defense Export Services Organization, or DESO for short, um, told him that he should go ahead and sign regardless. Now the head of DESO at that time was, uh, was on secondment from British Aerospace, which was Britain's and continues to be Britain's largest defense equipment, equipment uh, a producer, and his salary was paid by that company, even though he was working for the government. He was with Younger in Kuala Lumpur, and he was the person who negotiated the terms of this 
a highly irregular protocol. Um, his company, British Aerospace, had a massive interest in the arms deal. Uh, it was all too obvious where his loyalties lay, and there can't be a clearer example of conflict of interest on the part of a senior official in a government being played out in favor of special interests, namely the defense interest. And uh, I discovered by looking through the files that uh, they had had time to consult London. So the idea that they had to sign was wrong. They had full 12 hours between the negotiation and the, uh, uh, the broad negotiation and the uh, negotiation of the text. The British Foreign Secretary in 1988 was a man called Geoffrey Howe. Uh, he had overarching responsibility for the British aid budget. Christopher Patton, who uh, went on to be uh, Governor of Hong Kong and then uh, EU Commissioner for Aid and is now Chancellor of Oxford University, he was the minister in charge of ODA, but he reported to Geoffrey Howe. He wasn't in the cabinet. When they heard of the signing of this protocol, a few days later, they were absolutely furious. In those days, we had telegrams. Emails didn't exist, but the telegram came through. And uh, um, there's a former member of the foreign, British Foreign Ministry here today. But I think you were in Cairo in those days, weren't you? I was in London. You were in London. Yeah. Did you see it? No, maybe not. Geoffrey <laughs> uh, Howe called in uh, George Younger and demanded that he retract the protocol or find the money from his own budget. Younger said that if the money couldn't be found from the aid budget, the arms deal was off. Guess what happened next? Mrs. Thatcher enters the fray and insists that Younger's promise of aid would have to be honored. The uh, FCO, the foreign ministry, were told to sort it all out. The solution they came up with was to tell the Malaysians that there could be no linking of aid to arms sales and separately tell them that 200 million pounds in aid was available. In 1988, I was the number two in the Treasury's, British Treasury's international group I advised John Major, who at that time was a Treasury Minister, later he was to become Prime Minister, that no one would be taken in by this. It would be far better for the arms deal to collapse than for the de facto linkage to be retained. I had a premonition that the government was heading for a train crash. But it was wishful thinking on my part that a middle-ranking cabinet minister would stand up to Mrs. Thatcher on an issue so dear to her heart, so he didn't intervene. So what happened in June? 1988, one letter was dispatched to the Malaysian government denying the possibility of any linkage between arms sales and civil aid. On that very same day, not very smart, you'd have to say, another letter was dis dispatched offering 200 million pounds of aid. Now, after offering aid on such an irregular basis, um, which they hoped would be kept under wraps, you would have thought the British government would have taken the greatest possible care to ensure that any new projects for aid funding in Malaysia would satisfy ODA's minimum standards of economic viability. Not a bit of it. Through many twists and turns over the next two years, ODA was prevailed upon to fund a hydroelectric scheme that its economists and engineers, as well as their counterparts in Malaysia, in the Malaysian planning uh, system, deemed hopelessly uneconomic. It all started within a few months of the botched attempt to disentangle the aid offer from the defense deal. Um, DTI, the Department of Trade, forwarded a proposal from three of Britain's largest civil engineering contractors for the funding of a 600 megawatt scheme on the Purgao River. Now, ODA economists and engineers knew a good deal about the Malaysian power sector from earlier projects. Um, they were in close touch with the World Bank, who also knew a lot about it. Um, ODA was skeptical. Um, about the proposal because gas turbines using Malaysia's very plentiful offshore gas rather than hydro looked the best option for many, many years to come. And the World Bank agreed with us. But we knew, ODA officials knew which way the political wind was blowing in, in London. And they said they would give the project serious consideration provided there was a proper appraisal. The three companies had other ideas. <coughs> ODA wanted to send an economist to Malaysia to run the preliminary costings through the National Power Company's planning model, but the companies, aided and abetted by the DTI, said that any such visit would put at risk their negotiations with the Malaysians. After several months, ODA were able to send an economist to Kuala Lumpur, but he was too late. Within a day of his arrival, the Malaysian Prime Minister was on his way to London to see Mrs. Thatcher, 
with the main objective of securing a positive decision on Pergao. ODA found themselves obliged to make a recommendation based on the thinnest of appraisals. Believing that the costings might just about make the project economic and knowing full well Mrs. Thatcher's desire to fulfill the promise of aid, they opted to recommend that aid should be provided a mixed credit of 200 million pounds. It was an example, I think, of how towards the end of the Thatcher premiership, civil servants and Mrs. Thatcher's ministerial colleagues became cowed into advising whatever they thought she wanted to hear. By ill luck, on the very day that the advice was due to go forward, the aid minister, Chris Patton, was on his way back from Japan. He only saw the papers on arrival at Heathrow just before they were due to be submitted. Much to his later regret, he let the recommendation go through. On the next day, Mrs. Thatcher made the fateful offer to Dr. Martyr. And exactly two weeks later, the companies informed ODA that their costings were, were out by 100 million pounds. They were out by 30%, and that the aid package would have to be that much higher. The companies had taken the ODA to the cleaners. Chris, Chris Patton was apoplectic. Uh, the project now looked patently un uneconomic, but such was the dominance of Mrs. Thatcher at that time that ODA didn't feel able to take the aid offer off the table. Instead, it left open the possibility of additional aid um, and, whilst, and whilst hoping that the Malaysians would walk away or negotiate the price down to an acceptable level. Making a long story short, this turned out to be wishful thinking. Eventually, at the end of 1990, the Malaysian cabinet, ignoring the advice of their own power planners, decided to proceed with the project at the company's elevated price. ODA economists by this time had dug deep into the Malaysian uh, planning model, and they had concluded that the higher costings made Pergao uneconomic by a margin of at least 100 million pounds in net present value terms. Gas turbines would produce the same amount of electricity as Pergao over its 50-year assumed life that much more cheaply. But we hadn't reckoned on uh, Mohamed Mahathir's determination to build Pergao at more or less any cost, provided he could get the aid nor on the determination and guile of the contractors and their cheerleaders in Whitehall. And it's worth pointing out here um, that uh, we didn't realize, and I think aid donors often don't realize, that the recipient sees the aid in a slight, somewhat different form. The Malays, Dr. Mertier regarded the aid as something that made the, the, the project uneconomic, uh, made it economic. Uh, we were looking at it from a, a system-wide point of view. Now, they sh the Malaysian government shouldn't have looked at it this way, but if only we had insisted that the uh, aid should not go through to the power company. The normal practice in the World Bank and other donors is to say if there's a grant element, it goes to the government, and, and the money goes on on commercial terms to the utility. But we didn't insist on that because uh, for reasons I, I won't go into now. Uh, Dr. Martyr had a penchant for big projects, and he didn't have much time for economists. Um, he liked Pergao because it would improve his standing in Kelantan Strait up on the Thai border, which at that time was governed by an opposition party, although actually at the later elections that party continued to, to win. But he may well have hoped and quite possibly achieved, though we don't have hard evidence, that there would be financial benefits for his ruling party from one or more of the contractors. That was the, tended to be uh, the pattern with large public sector contracts in Malaysia at that time. As for the interests of the contractors and other potential lobbyists in the UK, it's worth mentioning here their unequal asymmetrical position. This is something that I think uh, Manko Olsen, the political scientist, talks about. The contractors had all the information about the project. They had ready access to the Prime Minister's office, and the stakes for them were tangible and very concentrated on the profit and loss. The British development NGOs, by contrast, had little information about the project, and to the extent they were interested, they focused on the environmental issues, which in the case of Pergao were negligible. They didn't know about the arms deal, and they had no access to the Prime Minister's office. Asymmetrical. Pergao was a classic example of regulatory capture by the contractors. Yet when the facts finally emerged, and they realized how appallingly the aid budget had been misused, the NGO community in Britain did get the act together. In 1994, three years after the aid had been approved, the small campaigning NGO, the World Development Movement, challenged the government by demanding a ju judicial review. Um, 
before the courts. And they, the judge agreed that there should be such a judicial review. There's a concept of standing in, in British law. You have to cross that hurdle first, and you have to show that um, as the applicant, as the supplicant, you have a sufficient interest. And prior to that, it had always been assumed that because an NGO was talking on behalf of consumers thousands of miles away, they wouldn't achieve standing. But the judge gave them standing, and they went on to, to win the case. Um, by that time, when they won the case, the project was half completed. Um, so the British government couldn't renege on the funding. Uh, but the aid program was at least spared from having to provide any further monies which had to be found from another budget altogether from the Treasury. But let's just go back to early 1991 when the British government finally had to decide whether or not to confirm the aid. John Major was now the British Prime Minister. He'd succeeded Mrs. Thatcher. And Douglas Hurd. Um, Douglas Hurd was the Foreign Secretary. Both Major and heard, knew about Purgao. They knew that it was an unsatisfactory project, but they had to balance this against the political and commercial damage which would ensue if the aid was now denied after Mrs. Thatcher's original offer. In ODA, it was perfectly obvious that we had to advise against, but in what terms were we to advise? I was now the permanent secretary of ODA, and I also had the role of what in Britain is called the accounting officer. And as accounting officer, I was formally accountable to Parliament for ensuring that all the department's spending met what is called the, the standard test of economy, efficiency, and effectiveness. It seemed to me that the economics of this project were so unequivocally bad that the expenditure, expenditure could not possibly said to meet this standard. Uh, if expenditure does fa fail to meet this standard in the British system and in many other countries, accounting officers may insist on a written instruction from their minister. In this way, they are formally disassociated from the expenditure, and the minister has to take full responsibility for it. Um, but asking for such an instruction at that time in Britain was exceptionally rare. I decided I had to warn ministers that I would require a written instruction, partly to demonstrate how seriously I thought the aid was being misused, but also, frankly, to protect my own back, because I was absolutely certain that this was going to be crawled over by Parliament's uh, uh, Public Accounts Committee at some stage. It was this unusual request for a written instruction by myself that in due course catapulted um, this project into the newspaper headlines. As a counting officer, I also had to decide whether the aid was within the law um, because the Britons, the, the enabling legislation for the ministry said that uh, aid had to be for the purpose of promoting development. I had my doubts. If the aid was going to be uh, used in such a patently suboptimal way, how could it be assisting Ma Malaysia's development? But I was advised that by long convention, um, since the project would be adding in the physical t terms to <coughs> Malaysia's power generating capacity, and it would work technically, that the aid could at a stretch be considered lawful. I should have stuck to my instincts because when the Pergau decision was challenged in the High Court three years later, the presiding judge asked precisely the same question as I had. Was the aid, was the aid for such a suboptimal uh, project really promoting Malaysia's development? And his answer was that it was not. And it was on that basis that the court made its landmark ruling that the aid was outside the law. But this, unfortunately, was not the only mistake uh, in the advice that went to Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd before he decided to approve the aid. Astonishing as it may seem, no one advised him of the risks emanating from the secret protocol um, that had been signed in Kuala Lumpur three years later. Remember, he was in another ministry at that time, and he didn't know about it. Very few people in the British government knew about it. I assume that uh, the foreign ministry's uh, advisers would have briefed him on it, since it was they who had cobbled together the notional delinking, and it was a subject which we in the aid ministry were basically told to keep well, well off, too hot to handle, too political. My, my research confirms that Heard was never briefed on the defense protocol before he approved the aid in 1991. He didn't know about it. Um, so even in the, the best, better organized governments, you can have these bureaucratic mishaps which can actually have a huge effect on a final outcome. Heard was a cautious and wise politician, and I think it's more than possible that had he known 
about the, uh, the dodgy defense protocol. And had he been, I, another man from Yale, good to see you, Sam. <laughs> If he'd known about the aid arms linkage and the possibility of a legal challenge, he might have taken a different decision. As it was, the consideration which prevailed in Hurd's mind was the need to honor Mrs. Thatcher's promise and not jeopardize Britain's relations with Malaysia at that time, and that's why he approved the aid. He had strong support from the Ministry of Defense. George Younger had now retired from frontline politics. Um, his place uh, in the role of... Uh, looking after Malaysia, had been taken by a man called Alan Clark, well known to Brits, uh, as famous for his racy diaries and for his personal um, predilections, uh, rather more than his political wisdom. Um, he was now the lead minister of Malaysia. Clark had no time for overseas aid at all. He thought if there had to be an aid budget, it, he was, it, it should be used to win arms sales. So his involvement, personal involvement, in the final decision-making gave the lie to the uh, public. Um, so why was it necessary to honor her word? But to no avail, the aid was approved. And John Major, the Prime Minister, endorsed that uh, approval. Uh, construction of the dam and power station got underway, and for the next two and a half years, everything went very smoothly. Then in late 1993, the National Audit Office, which is the equivalent of your, what do you call it here, the... Congressional Office of... Yeah, something like that. Anyway, the, our National Oral of Office published a highly damning report on the funding, and questions immediately began to be asked, how could such a patently uneconomic project uh, have been given the go-ahead? I was called upon to give evidence before Parliament's Public Accounts Committee. Um, the committee commended me for insisting on a written instruction, but they gave me a very rough time on many other aspects of uh, ODA's handling and the, the press went mad when I revealed that John Major had taken the final decision, something I shouldn't have done, but I was under immense pressure. Uh, there was a convention, um, it still is a convention, that civil servants do not reveal which uh, ministry in government takes the decision. Um, but uh, I did so. Um, I got a, a note from John Major the next day um, saying he d didn't worry at all. Um, I was quite right to reveal it. But anyway, um, the... Uh, the committee was extremely critical but they, of ODA, but they ignored the political power play, the, the political imbalances between departments in government. That's why we, we weren't as robust as we might have been. I refused to answer questions on the arms linkage, which I reckon was for ministers to explain. There was then a, an inquiry by Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, they also held hearings. They concluded that the government had had to approve the aid after the promises that had been made. I think they were wrong, but that's what they concluded. Um, but they had severe criticism for the way in which ministers had got themselves in such a terrible mess, particularly the secret protocol and Mrs. Thatcher's premature offer of aid on the basis of uh, misleading cost estimates from the contractors. Rumors of bribery had been going on around this project for a long time. Um, ODA was asked to investigate it by the controller and auditor general um, but we didn't have the forensic resources that uh, uh, your equivalent, um, your, the, uh, the audit office, expected of us, and we were unable to unearth any hard evidence of corruption. But then in late 1994, February 94, the Sunday Times of London published allegations of bribery which so infuriated Dr. Mahathir that he decreed a ban on all new public sector contracts with Britain, and this ban lasted for seven months. The Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd later wrote in his memoirs, I was, and I quote, I was defending a wasteful project on grounds of good faith and friendship with a man who was busy kicking us in the teeth. Well, two damning select committee reports, three full debates in Parliament, extensive and unrelentingly critical coverage in both the right wing and the liberal press in Britain. The, the London Times carried more than 50 articles and letters and editorials over a one year period, quite extraordinary for an aid project. Um, the trade ban on Malaysia, and finally the adverse judgment in the High Court. These all created a perfect storm for the British government that even I, with my pessimistic view back in 1988, could not have predicted. I've looked very carefully at the original appraisal undertaken by the ODA economists and engineers to see if they got it right, that their methodology. I had nothing to do with the original appraisal because as the, 
a top guy. Um, I expected the staff to get these things right, and I wouldn't have had time. I, t I took their appraisal on trust. So I was able to look at the uh, appraisal with entirely fresh eyes, and I just dusted off some of the project appraisal skills I'd originally learned in this city as a young economist at the World Bank. I, uh, I concluded that the ODA economists and engineers had, had indeed done a good job, in spite of the efforts of the contractors to keep them away from doing their work. Um, the economics of Pergao had been assessed through a standard optimization planning model that was used in Malaysia at that time and by many other developing countries and was well known to, to uh, power engineers and World Bank and the ODA across the world. The analysis was far from straightforward. The biggest problem was how to evaluate uh, Malaysia's offshore gas because there were no imports or exports of gas at that time. There was no possibility. This gas was very plentiful. The cost of extraction and delivery was negligible. Um, nonetheless, a depletion premium, so-called, had to be, uh, had to be uh, added against the time when uh, the gas would eventually run out. And it was difficult to uh, estimate this. The ODA used a relatively high depletion premium, um, which increased the, the immediate price of gas to reflect Dr. Mautier's wish to uh, conserve the gas for as long as possible. The other key and difficult issue was the choice of a discount rate, which is very important when you're, when you're comparing technologies, um, particularly between gas-fired plant, which is cheap to build but more expensive to run, against a hydro project, which is very expensive to build but very cheap to run. So the discount rate can, be, can play an important part. The higher the discount rate, uh, the worse hydro looks against a uh, uh, gas-fired plant and vice versa. ODA economists at the time used a discount rate of 10%, which was standard in Malaysia and in the World Bank. Um, and this was based on the methodology of so-called social opportunity cost. Um, but I think it would have been sensible had they um, compared the two uh, types of plant using a, a lower discount rate as, as well. Um, and uh, an appropriate discount rate for Malaysia based on a different methodology, so-called social time preference, would have been about 7.5%. I've, um, I've looked at the, at the model and, and, and the figures very carefully, and I concluded that even with this lower discount rate, gas-fired plant would still have looked the far better option. I've also looked at the uh, economics of Pergao in the light of what we now know, and I took into account two significant developments since the early 90s. The first was, to need a, it was the need to put a notional cost on the carbon emissions if the electricity from Pergao had been generated by gas turbines instead. Remember back in the early 90s, we, didn't, we knew about the, the carbon emissions, but economists did not put valuations on it at that time. I used the estimates for carbon values published by Britain's Department of Energy, and also those used by Malaysia's own energy ministry. The second uh, adjustment I made was to insert somewhat higher values for natural gas than originally assumed, because Malaysia's uh, offshore gas peaked rather sooner than had originally been expected. Both of these factors would uh, reduce the uh, cost advantage of gas-fired plant in retrospect. Nonetheless, according to my estimates, and it's all there in a, an appendix, if anybody ever gets around to reading this horribly expensive book, um, according to my estimates, Pergao was still the wrong investment by a, a large margin. The immediate effect of, the, of, the, uh, of this sorry saga was pretty disastrous for ODA. Our reputation was badly damaged and the aid budget suffered uh, further cuts. Over the medium term, however, the consequences were quite benign. The Labour Party determined, which was in opposition at that time, determined that nothing like this should ever happen again. And when it came to power in 1997 with Tony Blair as Prime Minister, ODA was re-established as a separate ministry with a seat in Cabinet. The ATP scheme was scrapped. Procurement was completely untied. Um, and poverty alleviation was now given a much stronger focus with the passage of a new enabling act. But the Conservatives um, had also learned some important lessons too and made no attempt to oppose Labour's policy changes. And when they came back into power in 2010 under Prime Minister Cameron uh, with the Liberal Democrats, they essentially continued with Labour's policies. What other lessons are there? First, well, the checks and balances on the executive before it decided to fund Pergao worked very poorly. This was because Parliament and public were given so little information about the proposal and because there was a cover-up on the arms deal. 
It would have helped if Parliament had known sooner about my request for a written instruction, which only became public two and a half years after I, 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 I'd made it, when the, uh, PA, when the Public Accounts Committee reported. And following the furore over this project, uh, the government of the day decided that in future any request by an accounting officer uh, would have to be um, indicated, would have to be uh, given to the uh, Public Accounts Committee uh, immediately. And I think if this had happened, the ministers would have been much more wary about approving the aid. Um, furthermore, um, now, as of today, this could never have happened because every, any project, uh, it could have happened, but the information would have been uh, available. Today, any project in Britain, overseas aid costing more than five million goes up on, 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 the, on the website of the department uh, with a summary of the, of the case. So today, uh, the NGOs would be able to see immediately if, if something as, as dodgy as, as this was, was to happen. The Economist magazine um, kindly reviewed my book in November, um, and they suggested that if only I'd gone public on the linking of aid to defense sales back in 1988, then this whole sorry saga would never have happened. But that raises a very interesting question as to the role of civil servants and in what circumstances it is right for a civil servant to blow the whistle on the conduct of ministers um, and break the Official Secrets Act and possibly end up in jail. Um, this is always a, an issue for civil servants, as Carol knows. I, uh, I did think about it briefly, but I, I felt at the time that um, this was not of the size of issue um, that justified taking that action um, because not only the dangers to myself but uh, what it would do to trust between civil servants and ministers. I don't know whether I got it right but that's the decision I took. But secondly, the accountability arrangements after the fact worked rather well. A Canadian scholar has written as follows. Responsibility for going against the established standards for fin financial management was squarely faced with ministers. The conduct of both officials and ministers was reviewed by parliamentary committees and the electorate was allowed to make an informed judgment on the government's conduct of public business. And finally, the successful legal challenge sent a powerful message that the executive in Britain had to be more careful in relation to the law, not just with overseas aid but in other areas of policy as well. In sum, there's no doubt that the British government's decision to fund this project was a case of very poor governance. The promise of civil aid to secure defence contracts was entirely contrary to official policy and international rules, and the funding was a, both a waste and an unlawful use of scarce aid monies. Whether it was a policy failure for the go British government in the round, of course, depends on the point of view you take. For the defence industry and their supporters, including Mrs. Thatcher, the outcome was, of course, positive. But I think for most voters, um, it looked like a scandal and a shambles. And for ODA, it, it amounted to the most serious failure in its history. And yet, that very failure led to a complete swing of the pendulum, such that within a decade, British aid, in terms of both policies and volumes, was far better than it had ever been. Um, Parliament, the media, public opinion all played their part, and in slow time one can say that Britain's democratic arrangements worked rather well. The forces that produced this negative feedback, this self-regulation, if you like, were largely absent in Malaysia. Lack of transparency and party and political personal interests continued to dog much of the decision-making on public sector projects under Dr. Mahathir and successors. So I think the, the swing of the pendulum is quite a... a a nice uh, outcome in terms of, of, of Britain. It shows that, um, you know, <laughs> democracy has its uses. Um, a vigorous multi-party democracy and a vigorous free press for all the muddle and messiness that they uh, sometimes cause do have their advantages. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy to take comments or questions. Thank you. Uh, here is the book if anybody wants to have a look at it, but uh, uh, I'm not on, on a selling round because it is disgracefully expensive. And uh, I hope it's going to come, come out in paperback in the next uh, year or so. Carol uh, has asked me to moderate a few, uh, a few questions. I have one first question. Um, you mentioned the Canadian Defence Force. I have read the book and it is, it is well worth reading. It's really 
Um, y yes, it did. Um, the, uh, there are opposition parties in Malaysia. It's not a, it's not a well-functioning democracy, but there are other parties. There's the Democratic Action Party, uh, which is a, primarily a Chinese party. Um, that the leader of that party did raise issues in Parliament um, back in the early 90s, but the, it was effectively buried. And the coverage of the press, there's no free press in Malaysia. Um, it's a, it's a, a, um, a press that really does what the government says. There was no real coverage in the press. Um, the book is currently um, um, uh, in the, with the censorship board in Kuala Lumpur. It's not available on sale. Um, but there are a lot of books that are similarly um, waiting to be released. Um, and I, I, I know of a, 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 a professor in the University in Penang who wrote a very good thesis on the political side of this and who, has been, who, who doesn't dare to publish her a thesis, so it's, it's a rather sad that there is not f full academic freedom in that country. No, um, I, I think the issue was never such a big one in Malaysia. I mean, they got the dam, they got the money. Um, they could have had the money for much better projects, but they didn't, this is the point I made earlier. Um, they didn't think they could get the aid for other projects. We told them they could. We said the same money would be available for, for high quality gas fired plant, but um, they either didn't believe that or they, they ignored that point. Mm. Fishermen on it, yeah. which contrasts with one of the projects that, that you and I know, which is the Tana, uh, the Bora project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Kenya, where there's nothing. Nothing. Well, at least yeah. as much money as that. Yeah. But anyway, yes. Uh, actually, I, I meant to ask a question. You may have just answered. Going back to when the decision was first made, you, you seem to be in a situation of, you say, uh, without strict legal controls. Economists basically get trampled by the elephants in the room. Yeah. Um, at least that's been my experience. Were you able to really identify, or do you think it's part of the job to identify where the 200 million or 300 million would have gone and, and to develop a constituent to propose it? Or, you know, uh, is there any way to do that? Yeah, well, the development community didn't know that. 200 million had been promised. Today they would because it's a much more transparent system. But we knew that uh, 200 million had to be was going to be, have to be delivered. But we did tell the Malaysians that it could it was available for good projects. Um, but uh, they they didn't really they weren't very interested. They were determined, or rather, the prime minister was determined. The national power company uh, didn't want this project. It was way down the, their list of priorities. So they would have been happy. Um, on the legal side, you mentioned, I, I think um, Britain has a much less um, legalistic administrative culture than in the US. Uh, there are very few, relatively few trained lawyers, um, either acting professionally or amongst the administrative staff. There are many more in, I've worked in, in Washington, and there's much more of a, a legal culture here. Um, civil servants uh, have, have many strengths in Britain, but many of us really were we're not very well versed in such things as judicial review. And we weren't as aware of the uh, legal dangers as, as we should have done. I think things have changed now because judicial review has become more frequent in Britain than it was when this, this happened. So if you just given the 300 million to the nations, they would have done Well, we weren't willing to sign, write them a check. It, it had, to be, had to be for particular projects. So, but we were, we were willing and we discussed with them offering the 300 million for gas-fired plant, which would have been much better in economic terms. Yeah. Mr. I was wondering, wasn't there a junior minister who was overseeing ODA? Um, it was Chris Patton. He was the junior minister. Oh, oh Chris was the Yeah, he wasn't in minister. the cabinet. He was the, we only had one minister at that okay. time. Yeah. Okay. So was he uh, protecting the top or was he uh, sympathetic to the bottom, yeah. i.e. the people who were uh, questioning this project? Well, frankly, he was torn. He was, uh, he was ambitious. Um, he wanted to be in the cabinet. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't, if you were a junior minister, you couldn't cross Mrs. Thatcher at that time and expect to, to get advancement. On the other hand, he, uh, 
he, he didn't like this project at all. And um, the, as, I, as I mentioned, he, it was unfortunate. He was, happened to be flying back from Japan on the very day then the, when the... So he was unable to hold an office. I mean, classically in Britain, something of this significance, the minister would call in all the officials and have an office meeting, and you'd talk about it, and you'd have a, a tactical discussion, and he might have found a way out of it. He, he might have demanded a, a meeting with the prime minister and uh, said, look, don't do this. We'll, 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 we'll write a check for these other projects. But um, he didn't have that opportunity because he was on his way back from Japan. But he deeply regretted it later. I mean, I've spoken to him many times about it. Um, and uh, yeah, he, it was a, he was the responsible minister. Are there ex other examples uh, you can talk about either in the UK or elsewhere of aid being linked to arms deals? I'm not aware of any in the UK, um, but I, I'm sure other countries have these. I know the Italians certainly used to do this big, big time. The French probably, but I, but I have no evidence. I don't, I don't know about USAID, um, but Carol, do you have other examples where, I mean, there's, in many countries, there's some informality about it. Um, you know, large aid program to Egypt, as I know, um, and a lot of arms sales, but I, I doubt whether there was any sort of absolute sort of formal linking. Like this, right. yeah. Tim, I was going to raise a, a, a related question, mm. and that is the immense amount of DFID and USAID funding that is now going into Iraq and Afghanistan mm. in support of uh, military activity. And is there really any difference of mm. morally or in substance between using the aid program to promote arms sales mm and using it to uh, advance one's cause in, in that sort of military adventure? Well, um, I don't think any, any of it is support. No, no DFID money is supporting military action as such. There's no money going to the military to support their, their fighting activities or their security activities as such. What is happening in Helmand in southern Afghanistan is that there are aid projects um, which have been extremely unsuccessful in that part of, the, of Afghanistan because you can't have successful aid projects when there's a fight going on. So I, I'm very worried about aid being used in these, um, in these high security. Uh, it's a big issue now in, in British aid because the, uh, clearly uh, countries that are fragile and uh, are, are insecure and have domestic violence need development, but actually achieving development while the fighting is going on, in my view, is near impossible. But, uh, but there's no DFID money going to support the military as such. But you've just said that it is going to support economically unsound projects. Um, where there is obviously a parallel with terrorism. It's high risk. I would say they're high risk projects. They are judged to be feasible. But I think the uh, assessments are usually far too optimistic. That would be my, my sense. Um, what happened to the British Aerospace fellow who was seconded and on their payroll still when he was helping to negotiate that? Mm. Um, and is it still permissible did really well. to have mm. people like that yeah. within the government? He did really well. He went on to become chairman of a company called Vickers, which is the, another major arms um, company. No, he, he didn't suffer at all from this. Um, which you could, I have to be careful what I say since we're on the record here, I think. But um, he, um, no, he, he prospered. Um, I'm not saying he prospered from this particular deal, but he, he, uh, he, did, all, he did all right. Um, no, the system has changed. Uh, five years ago, they finally stopped uh, companies paying the salaries of civil servants. I didn't know it at the time. This is something which has, I, I learned from my 
perusal of the files, I think it's an absolute disgrace that there were British companies paying the salaries of, of standing officials. I don't know whether that happens in the American government. We just have a revolving door, I guess. Yeah, well, revolving doors can be dangerous too. But in this case, there was not only a revolving door, but there was a revolving budget. <laughs> Um, you mentioned that in 2010 you, you made a trip to Malaysia to visit yeah, the dam. Yeah. Look, despite the process that went into constructing the dam, looking at the air, general area now, mm. do you think it has had a very positive impact on development in the region? Oh, it's a beautiful place. I mean, uh, and the interesting thing is none of the, there were only, it, it, there are only 50 operatives there. It's a, you know, it's, it doesn't take much to run a hydro project. You need some people down in the cavern keeping the turbines going. They didn't know anything about the controversy. Um, they didn't know why it was there. They had no idea. <laughs> there was a guy who came up from Kuala Lumpur who, who knew what was going on, but um, no, they didn't know. Um, development, yeah, I suppose it created some temporary jobs. Yeah, it employed a lot of people. The safety record was very poor. Seven, seven guys were killed on the project, and there were more than 200 injuries, which I think was probably quite high for a project of this size. Yeah, there is development, but it's not major. Sir Tim, is, was it common practice for a Minister of Defense to spend the, another ministry's money, or to promise to spend another ministry's no, money? How, how did the minister even think that, secret or not, hmm. he'd be able to get the funds appropriated? I don't know. <laughs> it's ne it had never happened before. It's never happened since. Um, George Younger, the minister, was a very nice guy. I liked him a lot, actually. Um, he was a bit relaxed. He was a S Scottish um, aristocrat. Um, and he, uh, he didn't really do his homework. So I have a question, too. Yeah. Uh, what, what is your assessment of the importance of the NGOs in, this, in, in sort of the way this issue evolved? If you hadn't had the World Development Movement or mm. others yeah. involved, would this have been, the outcome have been quite different in your view? Well, they didn't stop the project because, as I said, they didn't know anything about it. It wasn't in the public domain. Um, the, um, the row was very large even before the, um, the case went to court. The, the, the case going to court simply reinforced the sense of, of um, shambles. So uh, they did play a, an important role in lifting the, making this a, a, public, um, a, a public issue. But they didn't stop it because they, they didn't have the information. As I said, they were, they were excessively focused on the environmental issues. I mean, as you know, NGOs, dams, they hate dams. They always think that, they assume that thousands of people are going to have to be transferred and that the, but there were no people in this area. There, there were a few tigers, actually. I think they were put at risk. Or were they? Um, no, it was a, there was a white rhino, um, but um, and there were some communist um, types from the uh, Malaysian uh, uh, wars of the 1950s who hadn't realised it was all over. They were they were sheltering up in these mountains. But no, the the, um, the environmental issues were, were negligible. Yes, um, in deciding if the aid was within British law and whether it uh, promoted economic development over commercial interests, how does this relate to British trade and investment policies and preventing the promises of quid pro quo deals? Right. Um, well, British aid was, had always been tied. Do you know what I mean by that? You give money to a country and they had to spend the money on on exports from Britain. Um, what was new about this project is it was hugely uneconomic. Up, to, up till then, we had at least tried to ensure that, that projects were economic, that they made economic sense, that the benefits exceeded the costs, even though the, the, sometimes the, uh, the inputs, the, the uh, equipment was more expensive than if they'd been buying from Japan, say. Um, so um, there was always a commercial angle to the British aid. Uh, what happened in this case was the commercial angle became supreme and overtook the um, development angle. And, and that was really because, um, because Mrs. Thatcher and some of her colleagues didn't really believe in aid. Um, 
but they knew they couldn't get rid of the aid budget altogether because of public, um, public pressure. There had to be an aid program, but if there had to be an aid program, they were going to use it for, for commercial benefits. I was wondering if you had any views about across the board where economists are effective or, or less effective. I mean, in the United States, it, it ranges enormously. I'd say they're, they're very effective in areas like the Department of Justice, completely ineffective in, say, the Department of Commerce or the Corps of Engineers. Yeah. And uh, where do you see the role where economists can actually influence things as opposed to simply being swept aside by by other factors. Well, why, why would you expect that to happen in the defense, to, in the in the development budget, which, which clearly you think hmm. it now does? Well, actually, it went with the, the economics was very significant in the British aid. There were more economists working in the aid ministry in the 70s than there were in the British Treasury. It was a it was a rather um, revolutionary, interesting department when it was originally established. There were some very famous economists like Paul Street and. Dudley Sears, who worked in, in that ministry back in the 60s and, and 70s. And um, so economists were really quite powerful. Um, but gradually, they, their power was eroded by these political interests, these trade interests. And uh, they did a good job, as I said, on this project. But they, they were swept aside. Um, but I think historically, they've been rather significant. Um, this was essentially a technocratic apartment, a department. Yeah. Unlike um, some ministries in Britain where you know, the economists are just sort of backroom boys and in the end it's all sort of politics that mm -hmm. runs it. But this was a fairly technocratic and that's partly why it was such a shock to the department. We were quite naive actually. We, didn't, we weren't very savvy. We didn't know how to play, play games because the economists were very significant and the economists on the whole until, until they shift from economics like I did, you, you, don't, you don't sort of think in political terms very much. So I guess my question is, why were the economists significant in that area but not in others? I mean, you, usually economists mm. are significant where it really doesn't matter. Mm. Um. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I wasn't sure whether... Yeah, why? I don't know. I, I think there was just a... I don't know. Um, econ econ development economics was a very exciting field in the 60s. You know, it took off as a sub-discipline of economics. And... Um, Aid was very exciting to a lot of people, like me. Um, you know, we, we, um, we, it's sort of economics, this new discipline, um, sub-discipline, and the idealism, if you like. We were naive, probably. We, we assumed we could achieve a lot more with aid than could be achieved in practice. But the, the idealism and the commitment came alongside this professionalism, this idea that you, you and, you know, in the United States, though, I, I went to Yale in the mid-60s. There was a fantastic department of, um, called the Economic Growth Center, all these young economists like Carlos Diaz Alejandro and others who were producing all these development books. Um, and, and this uh, transferred to the United Kingdom. So the, the uh, economics of aid was far more sophisticated in Britain than, say, the economics of transport, which is ridiculous, really. I mean, you know, e economists were assessing projects in far off places where we didn't have much knowledge and doing very little work on major infrastructure projects in Britain. Um, and even today, you know, we've got a, a high-speed rail um, proposal which is going to link Birmingham and, and London. It's complete nonsense economically. Um, the, the economists are not playing a, a significant role. <laughs> really? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Right. Thank you so much. Um, that was really uh, uh, fascinating uh, who done it, and a lot of insights, I think, for all of us, a lot to mull over. So we'll look forward to the paperback.